think about it, if they didn't have to, they wouldn't change. And that's why they're in the trouble they're in. One more question. Um, what can you tell us, I think it was MIT that's involved in um, using hydrogen as a replacement for battery backups for solar systems. So instead of using batteries to store the solar power, they use the solar energy to produce hydrogen and uh, therefore you get rid of all the batteries out of the system. What, what can you tell us about that? Okay, those systems are the uh, using a fuel cell. Most of them use a fuel cell and they just drive it in reverse, which is very energy inefficient, by the way, because uh, they use typically platinum electrodes. And platinum, in order to make platinum work as an electrode, the breaking water part, you have to over potential the heck out of it against its natural catalytic tendencies of wanting to uh, combine the gases and, and turn it into water again. So, but uh, it still works. It's, if you've got electrical energy, extra electrical energy that, to waste, do it. doesn't matter if you lose losing some. And you can compress that gas, store it, and then later re reuse it through the same fuel cell and uh, generate electricity for a night. And, and there's a lot of that going on, uh, you know, it's experimental systems. Is it practical? Not really. Is it cost effective? No. It's very expensive. Um, just to build a, a, a halfway decent fuel cell is very expensive, and they're not very efficient. They're typically run in the 35 40 percent region, unless you're willing to spend the money, uh, a lot of money, for the exotic uh, chemistries involved to get those uh, 50 to 55 percent efficiency numbers. Yes. Not really. <laughs> Other than how loud it goes bang, you can you actually can tell from that if you light it off. Um, ortho hydrogen has a much uh, <laughs> much uh, sharper crack to it. it it's it's just uh, because of the more energy, it has a, a faster. Uh, what do they call that? Detonation. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, heating a home with uh, using using this type of technology. Uh, actually, yeah, there is an actual prototype system in place. It's uh, using, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the really big, tall ones. You take one of those little boxes, you put two side by side, then you stack them six high, or you know, three high, so there's six units. It's a big unit. Um, that particular unit can be pushed uh, relatively easily, 30 liters a minute and more. Actually, I pushed them over 40. That system can be taken and you mix the output gas, the hydroxy gas, with air, dilute it with air or some other non-combustible gas mix to slow down the, uh, the burn speed on it. And then use that in, on an iron heat exchanger. Hunk of iron with uh, bends, blow air across it, and then use that for heating air. And that prototype system has been on operation for almost two years. This will be the second winter. Um, if I remember right, it was over two, $2,500 for the heating bill for that building for this uh, winter season prior using uh, natural gas, using the hydroxy gas system. The, uh, the first year, I don't know how many figures for this year, but last year it was $200 worth of electricity to do the same thing. So it was a big difference. Although, you know, it's still in its prototype stage. There's, uh, uh, we can generate the gas. Obviously, we can build the systems big enough to generate the gas. We can build systems that can generate hundreds of liters a minute. I mean, it's not an issue. Uh, it's just being able to practically apply it. Practical application. Okay, well, who's next? Uh, no, I haven't. I would suggest, if you get a chance, I'd suggest getting a hold of this book. It is written as if it's a college history book. It's written by an investigative reporter. The last 120 pages of it is nothing but footnotes. He has collected 
all of his information from about 20 different museums, archives, Library of Congress, corporations, records, Thomas Edison's um, actual notes from all over the world. It starts out, first chapter is about wood and how the powerful were the people who owned the wood because wood was their only source of energy. The last chapter is on hydrogen and where we are right here now today. So it covers the whole story of internal combustion. The name of the author is Edwin Black. It's very objective. Very seldom does he put anything in here that is going to sway you one way or the other. He just writes down the facts. That's all I got. Question. What I've heard people usually use distilled water. Is there anyone who's restructured water or conditioned it in some way to make it uh, produce better quality hydrogen? <coughs> See if I can get this thing to work. Yeah, okay. Restructuring water. Um, there actually is a, I've been some studies done on them restructuring the water to make it to mimic other other uh, substances like, uh, you know, nice whiskey or something like that. Uh, and it actually, uh, when you restructure it, yeah, when you restructure it, it actually has the same effect but without the, the negative, you know, no hangovers. But uh, you'd have to filter. It's actually the content of the minerals in the water that contaminate the systems. So you need to get rid of those. Otherwise, they're going to build up in the system, build up, build up, and build up to the point where you've got a bunch of sludge in your system. So you really need to use a good quality source of water. Uh, melt some snow. <laughs> you, know, you can't find any still water in the cold climate on the side of the road. Get find you some clean snow and you know, use that. Well, air conditioning drippings, um, I've heard people that use that. Unfortunately, a lot of times you have a lot of metal from the, uh, from the condenser or evaporator, whatever the heck it is, <laughs> evaporator, you know, that actually will contaminate, the, you'll have that metal in the water, and it's the same thing as contamination. Uh, it's better than uh, most tap water, especially 